Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of like the that's kind of like the lady on the on the GPS. <laughs> or that's like that's like the lady on my alarm clock. Hey Google, good morning. Good morning, Tommy. Uh, okay, big offering day was today, uh, and we have the vote on the two twenty. 2022 budget uh, on November the 28th, uh, Operation Christmas Child. Uh, today was the final day for the shoe boxes, and we made our, did better than our quota that we were wanting of, of 50 shoe boxes. So that's great. Um, it's time to decorate our building for Christmas, make it a Christmas wonderland. So uh, Sunday, next Sunday, November the 28th from three to 5 p.m. Anyone who would like to assist with that little task is more than welcome. So uh, Christmas bling ladies, if you're 18 years or older, you're invited to Christmas Bling in the Fellowship Hall at North Richland Hills Campus, November the 30th at 6.30. Uh, we will enjoy some hot chocolate, homemade desserts, create new Christmas decorations, and the cost is $5. Please sign up at the Ministry Gallery and... Uh, and then Northwest ISD Angel Tree, um, where you can adopt an angel for Christmas. All of the angels have been adopted. However, there are still service opportunities. Visit Angel Tree NISD Ticks dot org between november the 29th and december the 10th angels that did not get gifts angels that did not get gifts turned back in will uh, will be back on the tree so there will be an opportunity there celebrate recovery uh meets in room 135 every tuesday 7 p.m. and all are welcome. So that's all the announcements that uh, I had. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know how Donna is doing this morning. Um, Pat tried to text her this morning, but at, at you know we hadn't heard as of yet. Yes. Uh, I've sent her a text that says, I'm doing well, lots of blood work, tests, and asthma treatments. I'm so upset I can't go next week. And this test is scheduled tomorrow at 4, p uh, 4, 4 p.m. Oh. Okay, great, great. So. Okay, um, I have a prayer request from Irma. Her son, Andrew, uh, has COVID, and we want to pray for a speedy recovery. And, uh, and she also mentions that we want to keep Donna in our prayers this week. And um, Will, you've got surgery coming up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. again. Okay. <laughs> Same song, third verse. I'm sorry. Okay. We have asked Miss Cheryl to come. Huh? I don't know what's happening. Well, that's you don't first. know what's happening. That's well, come up here. Yeah, y'all better be used to it. Come up here. <laughs> <laughs> well, this little lady has been serving the Lord at our church, and uh, 
If you didn't, if you didn't know that people noticed, they did. Well, I always said that if I did my job well, nobody would know I did it. Well, <laughs> only if you did, right? <laughs> that's when you that's when you caught it. I didn't do it well. well, we noticed. We noticed, and we have a little <laughs> certificate of appreciation oh, so presented sweet. to Cheryl Lynn McCarson for loyal service, always with a servant's heart and always willing to support the needs oh. of others. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you, guys. <laughs> that's very sweet. And you've got to read the card. You, you, have to, you have to read the call. Nobody leaves without a hug. <laughs> Brace yourself. This could take a while. <laughs> I'm a cactus. And I say that because if you get too close, you're going to stick. <laughs> I might put you off for. Well, we, we know you're still going to be part of the family. Yes. But. We did want to let you know. Oh, thank we, you guys. We, we did know what you did. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Sharon, you set a great that. example for anybody that's going to follow in the Christmas. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, guys. Very sweet. Uh, all right. That's all that I have. So let me lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that. We're all able to come be with uh, each other today, hear more of your word, um, and we want to keep those that are sick, Donna and um, Irma's family, her son, we want to keep them in our prayers. We ask you for a speedy recovery for them. And Lord, um, help us, help us, Lord, to to live the life that you want us to to live. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, we're uh, kind of finishing it up. Colossians, really. Got something? Hey, just in time to interrupt. Sure. Hey, just want to say, I forgot the announcement video. So you have the Bible Foster Group announcements here yes. in class. Yeah, just do it. They'll, they'll post it on Facebook. So there'll be no lack of you hearing about stuff going on, but I just want to let you know that. So they'll post it on Facebook here in a day or two and you can see it there. So. You, right, sent it, you sent it out. I know we we don't do that. <laughs> Somebody is going to be like, by the way, <laughs> deduction in your payroll. <laughs> <laughs> the That's the money for you. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, it, you know, Colossians, this really um the latter part of Colossians here is kind of called what a lot of it call uh, kind of the practical application part of Colossians. And this first part of chapter three that Robert covered a lot of last week, he is about mostly about you as a person. You know, he talks about like, seek you the things that are above where Christ is seated, uh, set your minds on things that are above, put to death, therefore what's earthly. And he gives a list of those, um, put away things like anger and wrath and malice and slander, put off the old self, kind of like pulling off clothes and changing and putting on the new self. So in all of that is, is, is going uh, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility. And he goes through those things. And really he's going to get in today more about our, our relationships with others first in our family and, and, and then others, but you know, you can't get, you can't get those relationships right until you really have your own relationship right with the Lord. And so it's appropriate that he, and he spends really more time about our personal relationship than he does about these others. 
And of course, a lot of this too, he's, today we're gonna hit things about family that he speaks a lot more about over in Ephesians, which we've been going through in our, in our worship services. Um, but uh, we're gonna hit it again a little bit today. Um, you know, so it's, it's just the way it is. The, the latter part of this chapter and, and the latter part of our lesson is um, more about the our inner our 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 inner reactions or inner um, communications and living with people outside of the family, um, our friends, neighbors, workmates, all that that kind of thing. So, without a whole lot of other to do, let's just go ahead and start with uh, somebody has Colossians three eighteen to twenty one. I've got that. Okay. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Okay. Um, Again, we've been talking a lot about this in, in Ephesians in our worship service, but it says, wives submit to your husbands as fitting in the Lord. Um, and, and this is more or less based, if you look up at verse 17, um, before we get there, and it said, and whatever you do in word or deed, and so in other words, everything you do, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, and that's in the power and authority of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And, and so that's the, the, I guess, the overarching uh, umbrella for all of this that goes down in our relationships within our families and with our friends and, and, and workers and, and, and such. So uh, Paul just applies that verse 17 basically into the family relationships. And he's first at ad addressing wives and the one duty that he gives the wives is submit to your husbands. Um, and this wasn't ever intended to be a, uh, an admonition for a, the man to be the dictator over his wife. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not, that's not the thing. It's more like what he talks about there in, in Ephesians. He said that he, it's a love like Christ in that he loved the church and gave himself up for her. And, and um, you know, the, the form of the verb that's used there in the, in the Greek is, is a, really a form that means that that kind of submitting is voluntary. It's kind of like, you know, an equal volunteering to submit to an equal. And, and you say, well, that's kind of weird. No, it's not weird at all. We do it all the time in work. I mean, you know, we go to work for somebody and the boss we have to submit to, but quite often we're not any dumber or less able. In fact, oftentimes we're more able, especially in the areas that we are. Hey, I ran a company for years. I'll guarantee you my typesetters could typeset. I mean, they would typeset so fast I couldn't hardly even see what the, the, the things that they were doing on that computer. Uh, I thought about learning a little bit about typesetting and I watched them for a while and decided that it wasn't worth my time. <laughs> it's a lot of work, a lot of learning. And, and I could do my, my self a lot better and the company a lot better just by paying attention to what I do and not trying to do what they were the experts at doing. And so we do this, we submit equals to equals all the time. Um, so this is not something, um, you know, that w w is really weird. And, and he, he, in fact, he, he kind of aims it there. He says, which is fitting in the Lord. Uh, the next one, he says, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Well, um, again, it's that love your wives is that agape love that Paul uses here, which is the love that's described as God. It's a love 
that really has as its base and foundation um, your extreme concern and care for the life and, and wellness of another person. That's, that's that agape type love. You know, God so loved who? The Us, the world that he gave. And that's the kind of love that a husband is commanded here to have uh, for, or for his wife. He says, love your wives. It's, it's just a very positive instruction. Uh, the second responsibility of a Christian husband is a negative. He says, do not be harsh with them. Um, what we can't quite grasp so well today sometimes is how husbands and wives related back in Paul's day. Because nearly all marriages back in Paul's day were arranged marriages. Quite often, the, the man and young man and woman that uh, ended up marrying each other uh, never, may have never even seen each other. I mean, one of them may have been raised in one village and another in another village, and the two families had been friends for years and maybe did commerce or things together and decided, you know, to cement our family relationships even more my son will marry your daughter and my daughter will marry your son. Everybody agrees to it and the dowry and everything that's put together and, and, and they did it. And quite often it ended up being really good. Uh, some of them really fell in love with each other and, and really cared for each other, but sometimes they didn't. It was just an arranged marriage and, and she, gave him hopefully sons, which is what was the big thing that, that the marriages in those days wanted because the sons were going to inherit all the stuff. Women in some classes and in some situations were more like live-in servants, <laughs> uh, almost like slaves. And they, didn't, they couldn't and didn't do anything without permission of the male. Um, a little bit like what you hear about very strict conservative Muslims today uh, overseas. Some, some women, once they married in wealthy families, sometimes they went into a house and they never left. They stayed and lived there the rest of their life. Servants <laughs> went to the market and servants did everything and, and they were taken care of there in the family. And that was the end of it. So you know, this one's uh, Paul's admonition for husbands to love your wives, be ultimately very much concerned about their welfare, um, was a really big step up for a lot of families in those days, for a lot of relationship between husbands and wives. It wasn't a matter of this you know, oh, I just love him and, get, and go through all this silly stage that a lot of young people go through. Uh, and then they get married. <laughs> and a lot of things change after they get married. And, and um, sometimes, frankly, some of these arranged marriages ended up turning out much better and much more solid in a, in a good relationship between a husband and wife. Uh, then some of our just whosoever will, you know, may come. Uh, that it's, it's just sometimes uh, the families could see the nature of their children when they're young and said, hey, these two would really make a match. These two would really fit. And, and they did it not just as a political thing. You know, a lot of, there's a lot of politics. You know, uh, one of the reasons that Solomon ends up in trouble is because he marries Pharaoh's daughters and, and all these different, and, and they, they, they brought in their gods and he trying to keep them happy and um, it ended up to his detriment. So, you know, he said, he said don't be harsh with them. Uh, that harshness is that, um, having a surly attitude. Don't be cross with them. Don't be bitter. Don't be resentful with them. 
Um, so Paul's, Paul's uh, wanting these, these, this relationship to be a, a good one. And you have to know he's, he's writing to Christians. And just like that early part of chapter three up there says, when you put on Christ, it changes you. It changes your outlook. It changes your attitudes. It gives you a heart of love because God so loved the world. He loved that woman that you're married to as well as you. And, and he wants the best for her as he wants the best for you. And so Paul's kind of really, we don't see it much today, but Paul's really coming down on the man to, to, to shape his act up. A lot more than he than he is the woman. Um, look down at verse 21, 20 and 21. Um, children's primary duty is captured in one word. What's that? Obey. 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 And and it's not um, you know it that obey is saying I'm going to do what my parents tell me to do. Period. And and it's a uh, it's one of those ongoing verbs. I'm going to continually always do what my parents tell me to do. Uh, it's, it's, uh, and notice what he's going to do it in. What does he say? <laughs> Everything. It doesn't matter what my mom and dad tells me. I am to obey in everything. Now, again, the good part of this is he's talking to Christian parents. So he's not talking about obeying in some sexual perversion or obeying by going out and stealing something or doing something bad or hurting somebody. No, that, that's not, that's not going to be part of it. That's not who he's talking to, but um, in everything um, it, and, and he says, what does he conclude there? Children, obey your parents in everything. For what? This pleases the Lord. It's the first command with a promise. Yep. Obey your parents. Obey your parents that your days may be long upon the earth. Um, and part of that days being long on the earth is because your parents, if they really love you and if they're really good parents, they're wanting that's they have that agape type love for you. They're wanting the best for you. And therefore they're going to try to guide you the best way to have the best life, the most fulfilled life. And in quote, maybe the safest life so that you don't get out and, and, and get yourself in a circumstance that is detrimental, uh, in, in what can be a, a whole lot of ways. And, and he says, what down there says, and fathers do not provoke your children. What does he mean about provoking your children? Don't lead them astray. Hmm? Don't lead them astray. Don't lead them astray. My translation says exasperate. <laughs> yeah, that, that'd be a, another good word for there. Uh, don't exasperate your children unless they become discouraged. How can you ex exasperate a kid? Sometimes it's just by telling them what to do. Huh? Sometimes it's just by telling them what to do. <laughs> just telling them what to do or telling them what they can't do. Uh, you know, sometimes that's, but sometimes that kind of exasperation is necessary and in long term beneficial. But uh, one of the, one of the things I've, I've, had a kind of a, a particular um, gripe about some parents that I've had to deal with in the past, especially as a teacher many, many years ago, is the kind of parent that you, you see them every once in a while in the grocery store or something. Some kid is misbehaving, he's getting into stuff, and, and mama says, You better quit that. I'm going to count to three. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you have you that. noticed quite often they never never ever get to three and the kid just keeps getting into everything i think there's nothing more exasperating to a child than not having boundaries 
that are set and firm. It's kind of like trying to play a, a, a basketball game with no, no boundaries, no rules. I mean, it turns into mayhem. And most of the time, these kids that are causing the mayhem are looking for somebody that loves them enough, cares about them enough to make a boundary. And it's, it's miserable living, not having any boundaries. And, and we've got a bunch of kids, I think, especially coming up today that don't have boundaries. And, 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 and we've got a bunch of miserable kids. Uh, my sons both teach kind of an engineering class. I was talking to Greg, my youngest son, the other day, and he said that he's got about probably about a third of his class. Um, now his class is all on computers. And he puts the assignments up on a big screen and it's detailed. And he explains, he goes through it with them and all. And they do it all there in class. It's not something that they have to take home. But he said probably a third of his kids have done nothing. They just won't do. And so long as they're not being disruptive, there's not much he can do about them, except give them a failing grade. And quite often, he sends home notices to the parents by text and emails that are provided through the school uh, about their kids are, are failing and never hears a thing from them until the report card comes out and they've got a big old F. And then the parents are angry and, well, why, why, why did you have? Why'd you give him an L? Well, they also, all their assignments, when they finish them, they print them and they're put in a notebook. And all those notebooks are there in the classroom. And he just reaches over and pulls out a notebook from a good student and lays it there in front of him and gets that kid's notebook and lays it there. And he said, take a look. This guy, this guy got an A. Uh, most of these students in here got A's and high B's and things. But you can see the difference between that notebook and your son's notebook, which maybe has next to nothing in it. Um, Parents, uh, don't exasperate your children. <laughs> and you're certainly not preparing them for real life. You know, when I have an employee and I give them a direction to get something done, and I know they can do it, they have the skills, they have the time, they have the equipment they need, and they don't do it, they may not be an employee too much longer. And that's what's going to happen to a lot of these kids. Maybe that's what some of these are doing out here, running in the streets and burning things and and shooting up things. Uh, yeah. You know, and they'll always say, well, I can hardly wait because I can get out away from home and I can do what I want to do. <laughs> you are never, of course, you're always under the power of God, but you are never able to do exactly what you want to do. You've got your parents, you've got your teachers, you've got your employees, you've got the law enforcement. Somebody yeah. is always going to have authority over you. Yeah, I used to joke with my some of my employees. We get to talking, and I they'd, they'd say, you know, a lot of you guys, you always want to be the boss. But you know, the problem with being a boss is that you have I got about 50, 55 in bosses as the boss because I got to keep you guys happy, your department managers happy. My board of trustees happy. You know, I got lots of bosses. <laughs> uh, all you got to keep happy is your department manager. As long as she or he is happy, you're doing great. So beware what you ask for. <laughs> and Anyway, it's, it's just, a, you know, so but says children obey your parents for this pleases the Lord. <laughs> Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And I think nothing discourages them much more than not having boundaries. So let's look over at uh, 22. Somebody's got 22 down to 4-1. Bond servants. 
Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bond service justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So, you know, at the time Paul wrote this, probably half the population of the Roman Empire were slaves. Most professionals, what we would consider professionals today, like doctors, accountants, um, teachers, um, craftsmen, most of them were slaves. Luke, the doctor, Luke, that wrote the Gospel of Luke and Acts, was probably at one time a slave. He, we don't, we don't know too much about his life before his being a Christian and traveling and, and taking care of Paul, but probably he was given his freedom for either excellent service or maybe he was the personal doctor for some wealthy guy. And, and when that wealthy guy passed, it was part of the deal that he would be freed. And you know, we just don't really know, but being a doctor meant probably he was a slave. Most doctors were servants that were sharp enough and had that inclination and the master would send them to schools to be trained as a doctor, to be the personal family doctor for that, that household. So he would take care of not only the husband, wife, or maybe their moms and dads and children and, and all that, but also all the servants that were in this, this household. But, you know, we, I think sometimes we think um, a lot of us had a background has had to work and we felt like we were a slave sometimes, <laughs> but you know, at least we, we can own a few things if we aspire and work hard and, you know, get, get the wherewithal to do that. But these servants really didn't own anything unless the master just gave it to them. They, they had no rights except what the master would give to them. So he says, bond servants. Now, and a bond servant oftentimes was a servant that had the ability to be free, who chose to be bound to the house. And I'm sure you've all heard the deal about where they take them to the, the main door of the house and they would nail their earlobe to the door as a sign that they were bound to that house for the rest of their life. They wouldn't leave them hanging there. They'd take the <laughs> nail out, I'm sure. But, but it was part of the ceremony of being a bond servant. You voluntarily became a permanent servant to that house. Now for some poor people, that was a step up in life. Without being a bond servant in a, in a house that would help take care of you, you were on the street and usually starving, fighting off the wild dogs and things in the streets, which dogs weren't pets back in those days. They were just scavengers. Um, so, you know, it, it uh, being a bond servant for some in a good house where, where servants were treated well was a real step up for a lot of the very poor people. And so he's got a bond servant and he says, obey in everything. It's kind of reminds you of what it says to the kids, <laughs> you know, be obedient and what everything. Those who are your earthly masters and not by way of our eye service. You ever work with somebody that they goof off all the time when the boss is not around. And, and then when the boss is there, they're all gung ho and looking, looking good. And, 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 makes you want to upchuck sometimes <laughs> because sometimes some bosses just buy it you know they don't have the insight to to really see what's what's going on but he says 
he's saying here, you know, not by way of eye services, people pleasers. Uh, you, you're to do your job and do your work sincerely. He says, with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Because ultimately, as Christians, and what he's talking to here is Christians who were servants and bond servants, who were slaves. And he's saying, you know, ultimately, you don't just work for your boss. You don't work for your owner. You work for the Lord. So everything you do, you do it as if you were doing it for God. And he always knows and sees what you're doing. Um, that, you know, could be the boss is not around that day. And you could goof off and not do it, but the Lord's always around. <laughs> he always knows when you're doing what you should and what you shouldn't. And when, you know, we don't have slaves and bond servants and all that nowadays, except some people feel like, let's say, they, you know, they work like a slave, maybe at their job, but that's, that's not really so because if they wanted to, they could just quit and go get another job. And especially, I think, right now, because there's a, about every company I've heard of is looking for employees. So if you don't like, you don't like what you have here, um, pick up stakes and go get another job. Um, you can certainly do that. So we don't have people that are in slavery that much, at least not legally. Now, sometimes we have some illegal slavery going on, and every once in a while, some place gets raided and you hear about it in the news where they've, they've had some folks that were really locked up in a facility and, and forced to live and work there and were getting paid nothing and maybe really being abused. Uh, but that's not, that's not normal. That's not what's you know, really happening. But he says down there in verse 23, he says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Um, and, and he reminds us, knowing that from the Lord, you'll receive the inheritance as your reward. So in, in essence, a Christian doesn't, doesn't just primarily work for an employer or in the case of a slave, the owner. They work for the Lord. And with the knowledge that, hey, um, I might not get treated very good here at this with this company. Um, I may not like my boss, but I'm not working for him first. I'm working for the Lord. And I'm going to get a reward that's far beyond what that guy could ever give me anyway. So basically, Paul's just saying that regardless of your position, um, you as a Christian were first, foremost, primarily for God. Um, you're serving the Lord Christ, he says there at the end of verse 24. And he says, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there's no partiality. So there's all, there's going to be that day of reckoning. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how sneaky you were and how good you were at maybe stealing from your boss or goofing off when you should have been working, which is really stealing from your boss because he's paying you and you're doing nothing that you were supposed to be doing to earn that pay. Um, so, yeah, I just put a note at the end of this when I said, you can't be a good witness for the Lord doing shoddy work. nor can you be a good witness for the Lord mistreating your employees, not paying them what they're owed and not doing what you agreed on. You remember the story where the Lord told about the, the, the guy that went out in the morning and hired some workers and agreed to pay them so much. And he went out about three hours later and found some more guys not working and hired them and then later, some more, some of them evidently right up to the, within the last hour or two of, of the day. And then he paid them all the same. And the first ones got kind of mad because, you know, but he says, hey, 
I paid you what you agreed to. And if I want to give my money away or whatever, it's, it's mine. You know, what have you got to complain about? So, you know, um, so long as we get what's fair, you know, um, we shouldn't be, you know, it says masters treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. So Paul's just saying, okay, you know, the employees are supposed to work and do their jobs right and not just be eye pleasers and just work when I'm around. You know, I think you've probably been around an office sometime when somebody maybe whispered, hey, the boss is coming, you better watch it. <laughs> you know, um, well, that person is, you know, just trying to play. I've had employees that um, I know would get on their computers and look like they were busy in their little booths, but they were in there playing games on their computer. Uh, that worked for a while, but then we got a program that's kind of what my son uses in, in school. Um, at the bottom of his screen, on his master screen, he's got all these little squares, and each one of those squares represents a computer of one of those students out there in the room, and they're all numbered. And anytime he wants to see what any student's doing, he can just click on that square, and poof, it pulls up what the kid's doing right there, which comes in handy, too, when a kid has a problem and he says, Mr. G., I call him G sometimes because golf is kind of hard. <laughs> Mr. G, uh, could you help me? And he says, let me get on your screen. And so he'll, he'll pull up the kid's screen and, and he, can, he can help him right there on the computer with, with whatever the problem was. So um, we finally had that in my company also. But I have caught employees playing games. We have these booths, you know, that a lot of the employees work in, the computer editors, especially editors and typesetters. And, and uh, so they get down in their booth and get really interested in that game. And sometimes they'd be so interested in the game, they wouldn't realize when I walked up. <laughs> <laughs> That's always <Yeah>. fun. <laughs> so, you know, just making the best use of time um, that that Paul starts talking about this, that walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of time down there in verse five. It's, it's, it's really, um, well, it, I've skipped some, didn't I? Somebody's got that whole thing. Colossians four, two to six. Continue, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray, for, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the world. For the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time that you speak. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how, how you ought to answer each person. Okay. You know, he, he, um, he started off back up there in the first of three talking about who we need to be uh, and, and our proper relationship with the Lord and, and how that works out in our life. And then he talks to, to husbands and wives and husbands and children and then servants, employees, and, and gives all that. And then in this last part, he he's starts talking about uh, some of the outgo of of all these proper relationships and things which you know he talks about continuing steadfast in prayer um so you got you got steadfastness uh then being watchful so alertness and then with thanksgiving with gratitude and and those are three aspects he talks about uh that prayer continue steadfastly in prayer it's in you know, it's not just that you pray when things are not going right or when you got a problem. Part of your prayer life is that fellowship with the Lord. And, and you know, uh, in one part of the Bible, it talks about uh, praying always, praying continuously. And you think, well, what I do, get, live the life of a monk, a monk and go lock myself in a, in a room and, and stay there for the rest of my life. And they put the food under the door or something. 
Um, and, and, you know, we had time in history back in the Middle Ages when we had monks that believed that and did that. And we still have some religions around the world that believe in that kind of uh, isolation and meditation and, and things uh, continually. But uh, that's not what he's really talking about. It, he's talking about this, using this gift of prayer that the Lord gives to us so that we can pray to our Heavenly Father direct. We don't need a priest to pray for us. We don't need somebody else to intercede for us, although it is good to have other Christians praying for you and praying with you about things, especially when, when you have uh, special needs. But he, he said, you know, to, to continue steadfast in prayer and, and being alert, um, Jesus told his disciples one time to, to watch and pray. Um, yeah, in the Garden of Eden, he, he tells them to you stay here and, and watch and pray, and I'm, I'm going further in there. So um, the lesson I just mentioned, too, that, you know, there's nothing that's too small or too plain or too insignificant to, to bring up in prayer. The Lord's interested in all of your life, not just the crises. <laughs> uh, so, you know, he, he's wanting to work in your life. And, and the more you pray and the more you, you know, I, I don't know about anybody else, but uh, one of the best ways for prayer is just praying with the scriptures. And, and the more you read and, and prayerfully read, uh, the more I think the Holy Spirit works in your life and helps to communicate with you and, and, and helps to shape your, your attitudes and your being. And that's just part of, of Chris. So he said, continue steadfast. Uh, just keep on keeping on. Uh, not just when you feel good and feel like it, but keep on keeping on. Uh, at the same time, he says, pray for us. Paul wants them to pray for him. But it's kind of interesting. Here he is in prison, possibly could lose his life, um, chained to a Roman guard. But he's not praying that for any kind of comfort or release or anything like that. What's he praying for? What does he say? That God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. He's asking that that you pray that I'll have more and more opportunities to share the gospel, the good news with more and more people. That's what he wants. And, and notice he, he calls it the mystery of Christ. Why, why, why is it a mystery? What, what about it is a mystery? Anybody? I think there's a lot of mystery in it. Hmm? It doesn't, the Bible tells us that. It doesn't make sense to people who don't know God. Oh. All the things that said, That's so true. you can go on and on and on about it. If you do this, it ends up that way, but it doesn't make sense because it's, it's supernatural. It's not natural. And so God's beyond all of that, all that thinking. Get blue jeans on the day you ask for them. Uh -huh. <laughs> Get blue jeans on the day you ask for them. Yeah. That was a mystery. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's just a mystery, too, that God loved me. I mean, here's a God that created the whole universe. And, of course, you know, in Paul's day, he could look up and see the stars and things, but uh, they had some weird concepts about what stars even were back in some of those days. But now, we, you know, if you go on the Hubble telescope site and look at the pictures of of the universe that they can see through that Hubble telescope. I mean, it's awesome. I mean, gracious. And the distances involved are just beyond comprehension. And a God can make all of that. Loves me. Um, part of the mystery is that Christ is a mystery because it says that Christ is God's truth. And it's known only as God chose us to make him known to us by his spirit, through his word, through his people, uh, even through his creation. 
You know, Paul says, hey, you have no excuse. Remember when the Romans says, you have no excuse. All you have to do is just look at the heavens, look at the creation, and you have to know that there's a God. Um, and it didn't just all evolve accidentally. Sorry about that, but I'm not anti-science. I just, you know, if, if you look at science really <laughs> objectively, you can see that and there's a lot of scientists that have come around to acknowledging that um, there's something beyond just this normal physical realm as we know and think of it today. Um, so he's, you know, uh, the mystery of Christ is centered in God's great love for sinful mankind so much that he gave his son to pay for our sins. And this was the message that got Paul in all that trouble. That's why he's in prison. Um, because of that that mystery and Paul's just asking hey pray that I'd have a clear convincing witness and the opportunity to share it more and more that's what I want you to pray for not for my release not for my health not for more comforts or anything that's what I want for and then that verse five and six he says walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Um, we get our relationship straight. We get our family relationship straight. We get our relationship with our employees straight. All of that's going to end up also giving us opportunities to be witnessing to others. People are going to notice if we're that different. And he says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Uh, keep alert to know and see those opportunities that the Lord gets you to interact, gives you to interact with those that are not Christians. And, and he says, and let your speech be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to, you ought to answer each person. You know, um, we've had these things that you kind of memorize, these little presentations like the Roman road and stuff like that. But the truth is that sometimes those don't work for everybody. You know, and, and, and while you, you want to approach people that you're witnessing to in a way that's not going to be totally offensive, um, make them angry, or react really negatively just before they even have a chance to hear. But at the same time, he says, you know, let your speech be gracious, which means you need to have some insight on in how you can approach and what you can say and how you can say it. But he also says what they're seasoned with salt. <laughs> There needs to be enough edge on that that it you're not just going to water down the gospel so much that it doesn't make any real claims or difference. You need to have enough salt to it, has enough edge to it that it's going to to lead someone to think about their condition and to to want to acknowledge that they're they know they're not right with God and they need to repent and they need a savior. And so that season with salt so that you might know how to, you ought to answer each person and who's going to give you the best insight about how to answer. Well, he just talked about it. All that praying you've been doing continually. And if you're praying and in communication with him and the Lord knows who you're going to bump into, <laughs> the Lord knows the opportunities he's going to give you. The Lord knows who he's calling and, and he wants to use you. So, so he says that deal says you need to make the best use of your time. You need to take advantage of those witnessing opportunities and not let them just to slip by. Um, he talks about that, how you ought to answer each person. Um, and that's where I'm saying you, you can't just use the same old 
memorized, hey, that's better than nothing <laughs> because it may work with a lot of folks, but it's, you know, he said, how you ought to answer each person. And, and you do that because of that prayer life you've been having and, and growing in him and growing in your relationship with him. And then he, he speaks to you. Um, you'll find yourself sometimes if you keep doing that, you'll find yourself sometimes saying things that afterwards amaze you that you did it. Um, and you know, I think Jude 22, 23 says that he says, and have mercy on those who doubt, save others by snatching them out of the fire and to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. So he said, you gotta have that spiritual discernment and that doesn't come from our natural nature. That comes from that relationship we have in Christ and that prayer life that we're continually having and and that fellowship that we have with the Lord and and that that study that we have in his word and all of that goes together to help shape us up and form us as a Christian to be the kind of witness that is effective. So um, probably what we all need to do, and I'll confess I don't do it enough, but just giving, you know, praying about specific interactions with, with people that I know. You got that, what is that we call it? Our one that we're... Who's your one? Hmm? Who's your one? Who's your one? Um, how much do you pray about that one, you know? And, and I think the more we pray about it, the more God will use circumstances to open doors and the more he'll be able to use us to say the right things at the right time that might open the door for them to come to know Christ as Savior. Um, comments? Next week, we're going to go to a little book, one chapter long. Philemon. Remember who Philemon was? Servant. Hmm? Wasn't he a servant? He was the boss. <laughs> Philemon, I think, was the owner, wasn't he? It's a servant that, that ran away from Philemon and came to Paul in Rome yeah, okay. and became a servant for Paul. And I think what may have happened, you know, we don't know the, all the background. Paul doesn't doesn't give all of the, the background to it. But I think what may have happened was that as Paul was working there and witnessing and Philemon was part of that, that servant was around the corner listening to. And after Paul left, that servant wanted more. And he decided to run away and find Paul. And he went all the way to Rome and found Paul in prison and became a servant to Paul and became a, a, a real kind of partner in the gospel with Paul and, and but Paul couldn't keep him because he was a runaway servant, runaway slave. So Paul sent him back and well, I won't steal all the thunder. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, it's a good story. Go, go read it, it's short. Well, let's keep praying for Donna and, and others that we know that are having some medical things. Yes. Text from Donna. They said that when she said when they do the test tomorrow, they'll move her to a different location and do the surgery later. But I had the same thing. I have the same doctor or if it did. He, he went in thinking he wasn't going to do anything. It wasn't bad. But I ended up having four cents. But he had to call a doctor from HEB. So it depends. I, I would think on how bad the arteries are. So she really won't know that Dr. Lay goes in there with not because he doesn't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lay is just a consultant. So oh, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Lay is my doctor too. Yeah. <laughs>
well. He went in, he didn't want to do it, but the road, Dr. Rose, that Rose said, well, let's just go ahead and do it. And he did, and I had to have four. So yeah. Have yeah, I got, a, I got a buddy that they thought he was going to have to have two, and they went in there, and I think he ended up with like four or five. Yeah. And well, once they got in there, they found things more been stopped been up than so. than they thought. So you got to have your ticker working good. <laughs> if it don't work good, nothing else is either. Not for long. Yeah. Not for long. So. Let's close with prayer. Lord, thank you again for your word. Thank you for all the things that it can teach us and, and how it can and lead us and help us to grow and just lord thank you for uh paul's having all these experiences and being able to to share them and for your inspiration of him to give us this word that, that has just been a miracle that that you've pulled off that brought it all down to us even today we thank you for that we do want to continue to remember donna and even others too in our, our class group that's uh, having some real difficulties medically and we just pray for healing pray for strength pray for doctors that have good wisdom and insight and do right things uh, we'll continue to pray for our pastor and staff this week as they minister to others and just bless them all with our country and leaders help them to do some things and be right in your sight we'd ask it all in jesus name amen